If you're wondering, he did mark it right. We're going to pick up at the end of verse okay. 15. Okay, it is Wednesday Bible class. It is March 13th. We will be picking up at Revelation 19, 15. And if you're listening in that hour audience out there, grab your cup of coffee, open up your Bible, and relax. We're not here to be professional or performing. We're very down to earth, so thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> and picking up in verse 15, we ended on a, a high note, but it's also a mixed note, because what the time that we're coming into is glorious. It is the return of the Lord in His glory to stop the battle of Armageddon. And we are going to look at that extensively, and that makes me realize I'm walking off camera, and I apologize, but I've got to get my little papers out that I pass around. If you are not in the class, you can just call up on your computer a map of the area, and you will see the names that we are talking about. But for those that are here in the class, if I can get to them. I have copies that I will at the right time pass around that show the Battle of Armageddon because it is far more than one little spot on the map. It's, we're going to talk about the length, the distance, where we are, so I'll not say any more about that now, but uh, we are talking about the horrors that are culminating in the Battle of Armageddon, and that's why I say we have both sides, that we have the glory of the Lord, and we've just gone through seeing that he is coming back with a sharp sword, his word out of his mouth that will slay the enemy, that he is going to rule with a rod of iron. That's the millennial promise that is coming that we looked at last time. He is treading the wine press. That's why even though he is in white, we see the blood stains. We see as if he were trampling out grapes, but it's the blood stains because the blood is flowing horribly. We are coming with him. We are the army that returns with him. We saw that in verse 7, the description of verse 7. And then when it talks about those coming back with him in these verses that we're going to open up and look at today, <clears throat> we see we are with him, but we are not battling with him. We're his supporting behind the scenes, cheering. Draw, go, go, go. But he is the one who is slain. He is the one who is putting an end to all of this. And why he? Because he is, and the, the description given, and I love every name of God in Scripture. Every name. It, we have a diamond in his names. And you have to look at every facet. You have to look at every color that comes out. Because a diamond will give you the whole rainbow color. The, every name. You have to take them all, put them all together. And we still cannot contain. And why I always say to you, in every class, his ineffable name, because he is too big to be contained. He is indescribable, but the choice word here is God the Almighty, or Almighty God. That's God the ruler, the ruling God. This is the final stage. Armageddon's been going on. It's not one day. War isn't one day. We all know that. It's a series of battles, but it's all culminating, coming to head, and this head is going to be cut off, in essence, on the very day of his return, there is war going on. There is fighting, there is killing, there is death right at that moment. We saw this before, but because it is fitting into where we go today, look with me real quickly at Zechariah. Zechariah, and we're going to look at chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14. And we're going to start, we'll, we'll start in verse 2. Uh, I think I'm okay if we can find out where this is, but keep that handy just in case. Okay, I think I'm okay. You've got one complete Jewish, yeah, and one New American. Okay. And for the sake of, of those of you trying to follow, I do use New American and complete Jewish, so I go back and forth. Um, but I try to bring out King James also, just to give us clarity. Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 2. God is speaking. I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem, against Jerusalem for war. This is what's happening. He has allowed the nations to come to that point. He's made Jerusalem a trembling, uh, a, a, yeah, trembling stone. Uh, I believe is how it said it earlier in Revelation. Uh, you know what words I'm trying to fight for right now. The city is going to suffer the consequences of not being in that right relationship with God. They haven't been following and obedient to God. When we're not in obedience to God, His hand of protection is not over us. And when it, if you if you have an umbrella 
and you step out of that umbrella, then you can't complain when you get wet. <laughs> so, but, but hopefully getting wet, you realize, oh, I need to come back in under that umbrella of protection. I need to get right with my God. But this is what's happening to the city. And the houses are being rifled. The women are being either have ravished or raped. Either way, it sounds horrible. It is horrible. Half the city goes into exile. Half the city has been carried away by the enemy. The rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. In other words, it's not going to be a full carrying off. This is not a repeat to what happened in Daniel's day. All of Israel is not going to go off into captivity. A lot of, of the people of Israel are going to suffer. They're going to be put to death. They're going to be carried away, but not all. And God, or the Lord in this case, Yeshua, Jesus, um, the Messiah, is going to come back to a people in that land. So they're not being exiled again. Because read verse 3 with me. Then Adonai, when all that's going on, then Adonai will go out and fight against those nations. Fighting as on a day of battle, as if it was in one day. He's going to, to put a stop to this on that day, and this will be a very specific day. We cannot set a date. We don't know when. But the people living through the tribulation will have a real good idea of how close it's coming because we know from Daniel's 70th week the tribulation period is a seven-year period. So they're going to be able to get pretty close and know, and that really, in my mind, is, is saving grace for them because it's going to have been becoming so horrendous that scripture says if the Lord didn't come back then there'd be no flesh left alive. Wow, that's not something, you know, we, we read these words and we gloss and we go right by. No, stop and think, you know, tune into the news at night and hear the devastation in an area or a place. You hear of a tsunami that wipes out a village and you grieve for the village, but now take this worldwide, the scope that we've been reading, what we've been studying, and remember, it's not, it, it, the last three and a half years are worse, but the first three and a half years are not a picnic either. It starts with the Antichrist setting himself up as power, that he's going to go out as war. He's going to come on the scene with his flatteries and with his, his uh, fake persona of peace, of shalom, but he's also going to come up controlling. And when he comes up, he knocks out three other nations also, takes them down. If you don't think that's bloody war, what is it? What happens from war? Death, pestilence, famine. Remember the four horsemen, chapter 6? We've been long since then, but all of this has been going on. And then it, it starts getting worse and worse and worse because we have the plagues being poured out. We have all the, the you know, remember when in our seven seals here at the end? Uh, it, bowls, I'm sorry, bowls at the end. It, each one is on top of the other. It's coming faster and faster and faster. If you take it to the picture of giving birth, you know how when the mom gets closer and closer, the birth pains are right on top of each other. Well, this is more than the birth pains because they're in it. But it, it's that just is building to such a crescendo that they've got to be thinking, how can I survive one more day? If they're believers in the Lord, they're being hunted down. They don't know who will turn them in. They have no idea who is friend and who is foe. They are hungry. They are needing clothing. They are in all kinds of need. As we go on and get into the uh, millennium and we see who goes in, we're going to see the description of their suffering during this time and that those who help them are being rewarded for helping them. So this is a horrendous time. And thank God they can tell themselves, hang on, hang on, he's coming, he's coming. Or if they do lose their lives, they know still, if we lose our earthly life, we gain the, the martyr's crown in heaven, we gain the, the life in heaven forever. No one can take that from them. Hallelujah for that. But on that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Now, if this was not literal, why did God spell it out? Why did he say on the Mount of Olives? If he was just referring to a mountain and just a kingdom and it's in the sky and, and hello by and by? No, he is being specific. His feet are going to touch on the Mount of Olives, which lies to the east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will split in half from east to west to make a huge valley. Half of the mountain will move toward the north, half the mountain will move to the south. What do you have in between this humongous valley? 
background. Well, God's just getting ready to set up his kingdom because it's going to need a big space. A little temple isn't going to be able to take the whole world coming up to worship. So this is all part of God's mighty act for a reason, but it also, I think, is because the battle is so far, too, and is reaching and touching the whole battle. Because the same way that the whole world from the east to the west will be <coughs> seeing his return, he's going to stop the battle of Armageddon everywhere. We're going to see he comes through Bozra. We'll talk about that, and I'll pass this around, but we're going to see he ultimately comes where he puts his feet on the Mount of Olives, where he sets up his kingdom, puts his throne there, and sits on the earthly Rome. So we see that in Zechariah 2, uh, 14, 2 to 4. I had down verse 9. Ah, yeah. Can't leave out verse 9. When he does this, then Adonai will be king over the whole world. On that day, Adonai will be the only one, and his name will be the only name. Hallelujah. All other mouths silenced. All other faults God's done away with. Everything else falls. There is one name that is revered. Every knee will bow at this name. It's the name Yeshua Jesus. And that time will come. And we who have been long waiting for it are going to sing our hallelujahs. It is finally happening. Go real quickly because it sets the stage for all of this uh, end time event. And I'm having trouble finding it. I'm in my Jewish Bible trying to find it. We need the book of Daniel, Daniel, and we need to go to chapter 11. They literally took it out of here. What did I do with it? <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm going to go to it in my New American, which is all right. I honestly, I don't know what happened. I think, I think my tablet is um, challenged right now. Daniel 11. We went through this in detail before. <laughs> I almost couldn't find it here. <laughs> Daniel 11 and starting with verse 40. So we're going to look at it quickly because we did do it in detail before. It is missing. It's literally missing in this one. I have no idea why, but I saw Ezekiel and it's not next door and it is. <laughs> They're neighbors. <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? <laughs> okay. Chapter 11, verse 40. At the end time, at the Battle of Armageddon, the king of the south will collide with him. Now what you have to know, thank you very much. Perfect. Oh, yeah, we'll leave both. You have to know that we're talking in Daniel, in Daniel, when he talks about the many, he's talking from the personal view. He's Jewish, his people. The many are his people. When he's talking about an end view, is looking from Israel. So when he says it's south, is south of Israel. Not of the United States, not of Utah, not of Wherever you want to say, Switzerland, I don't care, wherever you pick, no. Go to your map with this row. In fact, I'll start the maps around and you can just keep them going if you want to see them at other times because we will be talking about these places that are there. So, the king of the south will collide with the Antichrist because we're talking, I'm not giving it all to you because we've done Daniel 11 before, but if you look up earlier, the description you know is the description of the Antichrist. South is going to come against the Antichrist. He has moved into Jerusalem. I believe it's at the time when he's made Jerusalem his headquarters because his headquarters, Babylon, got destroyed. So he came over to where his buddy, the false prophet, is who centered in Jerusalem, and he's setting himself up there. And the world's saying, wait a minute. He might be a little weaker right now. I'm going to go after him before he can get established here because he's been knocked off his horse over here. Before he can get back up, they're going to go against him because they're not all in agreement with him at this point. He's shown himself to be who he is. He wants to have all worship. He wants to be the tyrant. He wants to be the dictator on steroids. And not everybody's going to agree with that. So what's south of Israel? Egypt. So Egypt is coming up to come against him. The king of the north. There are other countries north, but from other descriptions, Ezekiel, Ezekiel, chapters 30, 38 and 39 especially, we know it's referring to Russia. There will be others that are in line with Russia. They're going to come against him with chariots, with horsemen, with many ships. Ships tell me they're going to be coming down through the sea. Okay, they'll be coming down north through a sea that is there, but we also know the Mediterranean is on one side of Israel. I believe the battle will be coming through the Mediterranean also. Uh, he will enter countries, plural. This is the Antichrist going through trying to grab and be in control of countries. He doesn't want 
One, he wants them all. He wants to be Alexander the Great who's conquered the whole world and there's nothing left to conquer. Okay, but the whole world doesn't like it. When it says he overflows them and passes through, that's victory. He's gotten them. He's, he's, he's controlling those areas now. He will also enter the beautiful land. Now that's a symbol for Israel. Just take my word for it right now. If you want scripture later, I will show you that I think you all will understand and agree with it right now. Many countries will fall. We just talked about that. But these will be rescued out of his hand. And that's what's going around right now. Edom and Moab and the sons of Ammon. Ammon we know is Jordan. Edom and Moab are alongside going down the way are east and south of Israel. Okay, and we'll show you why later, but let me just tell you that there are other scriptures that sound like God puts his protective hand over that area. What's one of the cities in that area, if you could call the city? What's one of those areas that we talk about down south of Jordan? In Jordan. <coughs> and yes. Yes, south, southern part of Jordan. Yes, it begins with a P. She's got the it on the tip of her tongue. <laughs> with rocks. the red rocks. The one who I showed you video yeah. of. Yeah. Yeah. Petra. 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 Yes. Very good. Okay. Peter, Peter. We believe that the, the, the believing remnant, part of them, not all, but part of them, we believe will run and hid when God told them flee, that this is where they're going to flee. I believe that's why God's hand is over to protect them and keep them safe. So that's what we're seeing. They don't get swallowed up. That means all around them is getting swallowed up by the Antichrist, but he has protected. God always keeps his remnant. Verse 43, but he will gain control over the hidden treasures, gold, silver, the precious things of Egypt. He is going to ransack country after country after country for their wealth. Why? Because he needs it to build up his fortresses. He needs it to be able to do war. It, war is expensive. He's going to need oil to, to, uh, for, for some of the, um, the bombs, you know, the nuclear um, what is it that, uranium, uranium, uranium is going to be priceless, he's going to want the fields that have uranium so that they're his, so it's his atomic war that, that they're having to come against. So he's going to strip Egypt, Libya, Ethiopia will follow at his heels, but rumor from the east and from the north will disturb him, so he's on his Vendetta, his agenda, he's going after, he's swallowing up these countries. His attention has gone down here, and all of a sudden, from the east, it's going to come 200,000 in the army. We know the east is, is China, red China, it could be India and other countries there that will be joining. They're going to come together in a show of force to come against the Antichrist. It also says that he's going to have trouble from the north. We talked about that, Russia. Russia. Russia's going to say, hey, huh -huh, you don't get the whole world. We want our slice. We, we're going to fight you also. So all of a sudden, he's having to fight north. He's having to fight east. We know also Europe is going to be coming from the west pushing at him. And I believe that the only role the United States will play is part of that block. It is not going to be the power it is today. If it were, I think we would see more of that in Scripture. But there are many reasons, we talked about them before, for the fall of America to not be the great country and the great power in the tribulation period of time. So they come forth, they, they come after him. He will go forth with great wrath to destroy and to annihilate many. Remember the word many in Daniel? The Jews. He's still on his vendetta against the Jews. He's also on his vendetta against Christians because we read that. Those who keep the testimony of Yeshua, of Jesus, and those who keep the commandments. Now, some are doing both, Jewish believers. But we see he goes after Jews, he goes after Christians, he goes after Jewish Christians with a specific... What's the word I want? He, that's a specific target. He, he, that's, that's his... His thorn in the flesh. He hates them more than he hates the others. He wants to annihilate them. He wants to wipe them off the face of the map. Not just control them. Not just subdue them. Get rid of them. Why? Well, obviously, the ones who are believers, we know why. Because he's trying to usurp the authority, the glory, the worship, everything that belongs to God. And why the others? Because Satan has always had a vendetta against the Jew because God chose the Jew to work through them. And God's made those promises to Israel and the Antichrist who is indwelt with Satan at this point, 
who has the power Satan within him, is still thinking, if I can wipe the Jews off the face of the map, then Messiah has no one to come back to. There will be no kingdom. He knows what God has promised, the same way we can know what God has promised. And he still has the audacity to think he can thwart that plan of God and stop it. So he goes after it with everything he's got. He will pitch the tents of his royal pavilion. He's going to set up his palace, his place of authority between the seas. Now, if you're talking Israel and you see that the whole focus has come back into the center because remember, east and north is coming after him, so he's had to turn his attention to, to come to them, to answer them. What seas are we talking about? We've got the Mediterranean Sea on the left and we've got the Dead Sea on the right. I don't believe it needs to be a bigger sea because the it's a sea. It's called a sea. And it tells us furthermore, it says, and the beautiful holy mountain. Where is that? Zion. Zion. And what's the other name? Jerusalem. 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 So it makes it very clear. Jerusalem just happens to have the Dead Sea, like I'm describing. My map's going around, and it's got the Mediterranean on the other side, so it all fits. It's telling us geographically where the tension is, where the focus is. And when he's done that, when he has set up his royal pavilion, and he thinks he's going to get it, and he's going to roll, and he's going to win, <laughs> he will come to his end, and no one will help him. They're against him now. They're not coming out to be his puppets and his help. They're also after him now you know it, it's kind of like that the, the bully that has all the, those with them and then when they really see how bad he is and they treat how badly he's treated them then there's no honor among thieves you know and even they are going to be against him at this point that I love verse 45 he will come to his end he is going to be stopped so let's fly back in well let me tell you let me take you to Revelation 14 on the way back to um, our chapter 19. Okay, Revelation. Come on, Revelation. Revelation. I wish I could find one of these that I like to work with, that like me. <laughs> Revelation 14, and we'll start at verse 19. We want to look at where all this battle is that I'm talking about, okay? In... Uh, in Revelation 19, we're jumping in. We've got the, the another angel, verse 18, has talked about the power that's coming out of heaven. Put your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth because her grapes are ripe. Remember, they were overripe. They were ready to explode. That sharp sickle, that's the sword of the Lord that's coming. That's what we're reading about. But now, verse 19, it says, The angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great wine of the wrath of God. This is an angel working for the Lord, and, and this is part of the battle of Armageddon that we're seeing, where they're being trampled, where all of this is, because it's the wine press um, that's, that's the wrath of God. The wrath of God is being poured out on Jerusalem. It's being poured out on the areas around Jerusalem because of all that has come against God. And he's answering it. The winepress was trodden outside the city of Jerusalem. Blood came out from the winepress up to the horses' bridles. That's what goes into their mouth. For a distance of, and this one names it, 200 miles. Usually it uses the word furlongs in your other versions. It says it's 1,600 furlongs. Well, furlong, the Greek word is stadia, S-T-A-D-I-A. And a stadium, one stadium, is 600 feet. So when it talks about all these stadiums, it makes a total of 960,000 feet. Now, divide that by one mile being 5,280 feet, and you have a distance of about 180 miles. So it's showing you from 180 to approximately 200 miles. That's a huge area. What distance? What is that covering? What is it talking about? Again, keep your mind where, it, where we are. We're looking at Israel. We're looking at the fact that we know the battle is in Jerusalem and it's spreading out from Jerusalem. Some want to say, oh, well, this is a future radius around Jerusalem. This is the size of the valley that opens. I don't think so because I don't think it's time of that. That earthquake has not happened yet. And there's no point in that needing to be blood soaked in particular and nothing else. Some say, well, it's just the valley, of the Jordanian Valley is coming from that distance and coming in. I still don't think that exactly hits it either. But 
if we know that Armageddon, Valley of Megiddo, is the Battle of Armageddon, that's the Hebrew. It, you know, when you say Armageddon, or uh, you're saying Har Megiddo, Valley of Megiddo. When you know that it tells us specifically the battle is there, we read about that in Ezekiel 38 and 39. We read about it in other places. Then you look at Bozrah, and I guess it hasn't gotten back yet. Did this one go all the way around? Yes. No, okay. Yeah. No, no. Okay. Let's send that one starting that way. But whoever's got the map, if you look, Bozrah, you've got Eden, Boaz, Moab, you've got the Ammon, you've got all that down here in the south. We know that it says that he's going over those areas. They're protected by the hand of God, but he's going over those areas. We know that there's battle in Jerusalem because he puts his feet on the Mount of Olives and his sword out of his mouth slays those who are his enemy right there. We know that all these areas are being covered. Well, is it not very interesting that if you go from Megiddo down to Bozrah, you've got a distance of about 200 miles. So I think that's very much what it's saying. So if the blood is to the bridle of the horses for that length, are you getting a picture of the carnage? You know, this is nothing small. And, and I say this because if you're like me, your mind is too finite. When I see a sea of people and I realize there's a million people, I can't comprehend it. Well, remember it said there would be no flesh left alive if he didn't come back? Well, that would bring the blood up to that level. It's going to flow like a river. Maybe I should say almost like an ocean. This is horrendous. Thank God he's going to come back and stop it. It almost covers the entire land space of Israel. It's just short of, of that entire from north to south. Wow. But it is the end. This is the culmination. This is the final way, uh, war that's waged during the, the tribulation. This is the crescendo. And the Lord himself steps in once and for all. Yes. Now this is the Lord's revenge. Does the Lord revenge? Yes. It is holy and righteous vengeance. It is righteous anger. It is against sin. It is against evil. It is against Satan and his cohorts. Go with me to Isaiah. I want to go to Isaiah. Uh, let's go to 63. Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63. And we've read it before. We're only going to look at verse 4 right now. Okay, that tells, whoops, there we go. It wants to freeze, but it got there. The way of shalom, the way of peace, they do not know. Their goings about will be no law. They make devious paths for themselves. No one treading them will ever know peace. What a description. Now we've got the Prince of Peace coming back, okay? But this, um, I want to show you how it's the Lord's revenge. So go with me to Ezekiel. Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 38. And if you want a whole view of the Battle of Armageddon, read chapters 38 and 39 in their entirety because it's talking about that battle in particular, um, what, what those battles that all make up the Battle of Armageddon. Verse 19 says, I will take you, Israel, I'll take you from among the nations. I will gather you from all countries. I will return you to your own soil. This is what the purpose is. Remember, God's vengeance is going to have his purpose fulfilled. And he has promised Israel, I will make a full end of the nations that come against you, but I will not make a full end of you. He is on his warpath against those who have been against the apple of his eye. Now, is it because they've been a holy and a righteous people and they deserve? No. That's why they've been in the, the, the um, where do you get taken? Woodshed. <laughs> because they haven't been right. But he is not going to allow them to be destroyed. He does not punish to destroy. He punishes to correct. They're finally going to be crying out to him and looking to him. We're going to see that at this point when he returns, the nation of Israel is going to realize he is our Messiah. But here he is showing that he is the one who is keeping his work. He is bringing vengeance against those who come against Israel. And rightfully so. He has the right because he said it and he will do it. Go with me to Nahum. 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 
a little book. If you can't find it fast, just listen. We're in chapter one because I want to keep moving. I want to stay in the battle. I want to get to the victory. Come on, tablet. There we go. Nahum 1, we'll start with verse 2. For all the peoples will walk, each in the name of its God. Okay, we've got that today. It'll be all the more prevalent in, in the tribulation time. Only the one true and living God. All the rest, these are the peoples walking by the names of other gods. There'll be those who are holding up Allah. I believe the Antichrist God is Allah. There's argument there, but I think so. Anyway, we will walk in the name of Adonai, our God. And how is it going to happen? Or I shouldn't say how, I don't mean that, but the time here, it will be forever and ever. When that day comes, says Adonai, says the Lord, I will assemble the lame, I will gather those who were dispersed, along with those I afflicted. Remember, Israel has suffered consequences because of her disobedience, but it's not a, a forever and a complete. Um, I will make the lame a remnant, those who were driven off a strong nation. I'm going to bring my people back. We know other places tell us he's going to bring them back from the four corners of the earth. He's going to bring the Jews back into Israel and make Israel a strong nation. Adonai the Lord will rule over them on Mount Zion. That's in Israel, people, from that time forth and forever. How far do I want to read? Let's go on to verse 7. You, tower of the flock, kill the daughter of Zion. To you, who former sovereignty will, will return the royal power of the daughter of Jerusalem. Remember how we just read Jerusalem was being trampled underfoot? Now it's saying you're going to have the royal power. The royal king's going to sit on his throne in Jerusalem, and you will have that power. Why are you now crying out? Don't you have a king? Has your counselor been destroyed that you're seized like a pain for a woman in labor? Well, be in pain. Work to give birth like a woman in labor, daughter of Zion. For now you will go out of the city, live in the wilds till you reach Babel, Babel, till you reach that confusion. But there, when you've gone out into that world, out from under my protection, and you're finally crying out, there you will be rescued. Does he say, there, I'll, I'll let you go, and that's it forever, and I'll work with another people, I'll replace you? No, no. He says, there you will be rescued. There, Adonai, the Lord will redeem you from the power of your enemies. He is doing this to rid Israel of her enemies. He is doing this to bring her to what he has promised her. Not because she deserves, but because God is God. And his word is true. And he says unconditional, he does unconditional. If he says it's on condition, then he will be on condition. He promised <coughs> blessing if they were obedient, but he promised I will never allow you to come to a full end. Thank God for that, because take that into us today. Take that to the body of uh, believers called the church. We have a great church in today. It's called the Church of Philadelphia. We saw it in Revelation 3. It starts a little before verse 10, I think. But verse 10 is a highlight of it because he promises the church to rescue us before this. Philadelphia is on fire. Philadelphia is doing for the Lord. Philadelphia is sending out missionaries so that others can hear and get saved. And he commands Philadelphia. At the very same time, he condemns Laodicea. You think you're rich, you're poor. You think you're clothed in the finest, you're naked. You think you can see, you're blind. You don't realize how wretched, how poor, how naked you are. Wake up. You've allowed everything to come in and influence and to mix in, and you, you don't have a truth anymore. There's a small remnant in you of truth, but you've allowed it to, to be uh, putrefied by all that's around you. Well, if God sees the church in that disgrace, if God saw Israel in that disgrace and said, done with you, I'm not going to keep my word to you, then why on earth would we stand here secure today that God wouldn't say, done with you, you've tarnished yourself too, have a nice life. Yeah, right, apart from God, it's hell. Okay, thank God. And I say this loud and strong because I want you to see God is God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he makes a promise in eternity past, it's good in eternity future. Yes. If he tells you this is it, take it to the bank. Stake your life on it. How many people will literally do that in the tribulation? So many that when we look at the throne, 
We can't number them. We can't count that high. How many are under the throne? And at the point that we see them innumerable, their number isn't complete because they're crying out, how long before you venge us, Lord? How long, how long? And he says, wait, wait a little bit longer till your number is complete. Then I will. And boy, when he's on the warpath, look out. <laughs> he is coming on the warpath. That is what we are seeing. So the vengeance is the Lord's, and it's going to reveal himself, not just to Israel, but to the entire world. But let's look at it from Israel. Hezekiel, Ezekiel, chapter 38. I should have told you to keep a hand in there, but I never remember. We go all over. Ezekiel, chapter 38, and we're going to read this time verse 23. Ezekiel 38 and verse 23. And we read in verse 23, You will live in the land I gave to your ancestors. Hmm. Who were the ancestors? Who is Ezekiel? Is he Muslim? There's no such thing. Muslim doesn't even come until 700 AD. Is he... I'm trying to think back that far. Is he a Hittite? Is he a, a Malachite, an Edomite? Who is he? He's Jewish, right? So if God's talking to him about his land and his ancestors, as soon as a Jewish person hears you mention ancestors or forefathers, who is immediately in their mind? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Where did Israel come from? Who's Israel's forefathers? Who's Israel's ancestors? Abraham, Yisach, Yaakov, that's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You have to keep it in context. He did not say this to the church. He didn't put the church in here. There is no church here in Ezekiel's day. It doesn't start until after the Lord has come, first coming, and gone back up into heaven. It doesn't start till we're reading in Acts 2. And that's going to be, I'm just rounding it off, but approximately, it's before 40 AD, but it's, it is close to that, okay? 35-ish AD, let me put it that way. We're right now way back, okay? You will live in the land I gave to your ancestors. Abraham, I promised you this land. Isaac, I promised you this land. Jacob, I promised you this land. Your 12 sons, I promised you this land. In fact, when they went into the land, it was divided among the 12 tribes. And these were not other tribes. These were not other peoples. It gives the names. We're going to see those 12 tribes come up in inheritance in Revelation yet. When we get to 21, that's cool. But right now, we're talking about the land. And then he says very clearly, and I love him for this, you will be my people. I will be your God. Here's his unconditional promise. This will be. Okay, so this is a revelation of himself. Keeping that in mind, go to the next chapter, 39. Look at chapter 39, look at verses 21 and 22. And what do we read? Then he said to me, um, I don't like it in my complete truth. It says human being, Christ is son of man, but it's a little less. It's mankind, it's people, Okay. What we're, what we're talking about, and again, I've jumped into the middle, but Ezekiel's been given a vision, and he sees skeletons. He sees a bunch of dry bones, dead dry bones. He's been asked, can they live again? Okay? Israel is like dry bones right now. When you're dry bones, there's no spirit. Israel, as a whole, is missing the spirit of God right now. If you go to the land of Israel, I love Israel. It's got my heart always. But is she a land honoring unto her God? No. She, her standard is not a holy standard. It is very worldly. It is it's not keeping the commandments of God, okay? As a whole I'm talking about. So, yes, they're back in the land. God promised. We see that in Ezekiel 37. Now he's been asked, can these bones live again? Who are these bones? Well, he tells us specifically in verse 21, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They are saying, our bones have dried up, our hope is gone, we're completely cut off. Therefore prophesy, say to them, Lord God, Adonai Elohim says. You know that old commercial when E.F. Hutton speaks and everybody gets quiet and listens? 
I don't care what E.F. Hutton says, but when the Lord God speaks, yes. I want to put a behold right here. Yes. Listen, when he speaks, sit up, pay attention, notice, and take it as he says. My people, I will open your graves. I will make you get up out of your graves. I will bring you back into the land of Israel. They literally came out of the graves in the other nations due to the Holocaust especially. Out of the ashes of the Holocaust is the birth of Israel, the rebirth of a nation born in a day. God said a nation would be born in a day. Go to any point in history, any other time you want, and go to the history of the beginning of a nation, and you will not find a nation born in a day apart from Israel. God said it, God did it. Verse 23, then you will know that I am Adonai. When I've opened your graves and made you get up out of your graves, my people. When you see this happen, when you see verse 24, I put my spirit in you and you will be alive. Then I place you in your own land. And you will know that I, Adonai, I the Lord have spoken. I have done it. <clears throat> Notice who does it? The Lord does it. Israel doesn't do it. Are you reading, what were you reading? Ezekiel 39. I read 21 to 24. I was supposed to stop at 22 and I got wound up. I get on my soapbox. <laughs> is this literal or is this like a parable? Is this literal or is it a parable? That part is a picture to show us life coming back out of death. How do we get life out of death? The resurrection power of Yeshua, Jesus. That way he pours himself into Israel and they become a living people. We're talking spiritually. We're talking that he brings them back to life spiritually. So it's, spiritual. it's more of a parable more than <laughs> it's they, they a really come in, the bones right. come into life. Yeah, it's not that they're literally going to be this person was it's buried and they're just a bunch of bones left and now they're back to life. It's going to be as if they were a dead people though because they were dead in their sins he and he's right brought now. them back to life in we his spirit. So he's spirit. breathed into them and they become a spiritual being now. This is Israel coming back at the end of the Battle of Armageddon where the Lord is going to set up his kingdom, where Israel is going to be in obedience to the Lord and he is going to bless them because they're right with him. But it is he who does it. It's not that he comes back to purified and ready and right Israel. Thank God it's not waiting on that because we're going in the wrong direction the same way this world is going in the wrong direction. Anyone who thinks this world is getting better Open your eyes. Turn on the news. Look around you. It is not. If it was dependent on getting better, oh God, help us. We're losing the battle. But it's not. It's dependent on the Lord. He is going to do it. And he is going to bring back that spirit. He's going to bring them from the four corners of the earth. The Jews will still have been scattered when he returns. Remember, he said part of Jerusalem was going into exile. Part has been scattered. When the Jews are being hunted down, the ones who have many can get out are going to get out. The ones that are already out are going to stay out. I, if, if I were a Jew alive in the tribulation, living in San Bernardino, California, I wouldn't run into Israel. I'd run away <laughs> because so much is happening there. But it, remember, it's worldwide. I'm not going to escape it because I'm in San Bernardino. San Bernardino is going to suffer the tribulation horrors also. It's worldwide. Catastrophe on top of catastrophe. Worldwide. What happens to the humanitarian nations that rush to the aid of a people at a time of a catastrophe? Who's going to rush to the aid? Because they're all going to need aid. It's, it's a time of stress. It's a time everything is crumbling. And if the Lord didn't come back, no one would be left alive. Whew. That's why that blood is so hot. Look at Joel, Joel, chapter 3, right after Ezekiel. Joel, chapter 3, and we're going to look at, and I have to go to my, because um, the, the chapters are different in the Jewish Bible, so I'm going to go to my New American Standard, and I want, there's Joel. Joel chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. The Lord, the Lord, roars from Zion. How was he described in Revelation 5? Lamb who was 
as if slain, who is now what? Lion of the tribe of Judah. Okay. Verse 16, the Lord roars, the lion is roaring, the Lord from, from Zion, from Zion, utters his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens tremble, the earth trembles. Have you ever been around a voice that booms so much that you feel it under your feet? <laughs> this whole world, heaven and earth, is going to tremble. But the Lord is a refuge for his people, a stronghold to the sons of Israel, then you will know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, Zion, my holy mountain. So Jerusalem will be holy, and strangers will pass through it no more. It's going to be his holy city, and everyone who comes through knows him. This is the Lord's revenge. This is his doing. This is the time of his setting up his kingdom. And I'm going to side note just in a sentence. Many times you will hear good messages. I'll put it that way. That take Ezekiel 38 and 39 and say it's in the beginning of the tribulation or it's in, at the midpoint. Well, I want to ask you, how can it culminate in this at the beginning or the mid? It doesn't work. This is the Battle of Armageddon. 38 and 39 is at the end. Because if you read through, I don't know how many times it says, they will know I am the Lord. 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 When is the world going to know he is the Lord? When are they going to see it and know it? Because we read they deny him all the way through the tribulation. Remember, they're even, they're crying out in pain, and they still blaspheme him. They still go against him. Satan still thinks, I can win. The world is going to know at the end he is Lord. The world is going to remember. We thought this one was so great when he came on with his fake peace. Whoa, he's puny. He's nothing. Look what God did with him. <laughs> the Lord is the power, and it's Amen. seen at the end. Amen. So for me, Ezekiel 38 and 39 can only be at the end. Then take the book in order, chapter 37, Israel's back in the land, dry bones. 38 and 39 is a battle. What's 40 to 48, which is the rest of the book? Millennial Temple. <coughs> it's a beautiful temple. Don't put that temple during the tribulation time because the glory of the Lord fills that temple. He comes through the eastern gate that he said would be blocked up till the glory of Messiah comes through it again. Guess what? I wish I'd known I was going to say that. I have a picture for you. you. Call up the Eastern Gate tonight. Those of you who go Google, call up the Eastern Gate. Can anybody walk through the Eastern Gate? <coughs> Kathy's seen it. I've seen it. Maybe some others of you have seen it. It's yeah. blocked up. Yeah. <laughs> they don't know why they did it. They did it because God said it's going to be blocked up till my glory goes through it yeah. again. He's going to blast it open. And those who are Muslim belief have put a graveyard in front of it because they heard that a Jewish person can't go through a graveyard without being desecrated. So because the, the, those prophecies for those who believe that, believe that this Messiah, this God, is going to go through that, well, we're going to complicate it. He can't go through it now because we put a graveyard there. You think that's going to stop my God? <laughs> Step on top of it. It's going to tremble. It's going to shake. He's going to blast that open and his glory is going to go through it and it goes right straight into the temple area. He's going to set up his temple and no one is going to be able to say a word against his glory. Hallelujah. Okay, this is also the, t well, okay, i got to rephrase I'm going to say that. When we talk about the day of the Lord, remember it starts with the tribulation, but it goes all the way through millennium, and it goes through all the way till we come to what we'll call eternity future. So it's going to go to the time when the Lord is going to make a new heavens and a new earth. We're going to read about that entire renovation. That comes after the millennium. So my little picture for right now, what I'm talking about, here's tribulation, here's millennium, here's when Satan is let loose gets people to follow him. Here's the great white throne judgment. And then we're going to read about the new heavens and the new earth. So we're right here on the edge of that eternity. Okay? That's what I'm talking about. Go with me to 2 Peter. Because remember, this is the Lord's doing. This is showing him in all his power, in all his might, in all his victory. This is King of kings and Lord of lords. This is not 
any other time before, we don't see that. <coughs> but we see it now and we see it in its entirety. Second Peter, second Kepha, verse 10. Starts right off letting us know the time is talking about. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. What did I just call the tribulation? That what starts, when the tribulation starts, it is the day of the Lord. Okay? When you read that term in scripture, you know it's starting with the tribulation and it's carrying on. Now, it says it comes as a thief in the night. Well, it doesn't say the night here, but it comes like a thief. There's another place where it talks about a thief in the night. Let me also help you stay straight so you don't get confused. We are not of the night. We're children of the day. We're children of the light. It doesn't come like a thief to us. When the Lord comes for us, he doesn't come like a thief, stealing. No, but to the world in darkness is like a thief that has suddenly come upon them. Remember, they think Antichrist is great. And they've entered into the period of the worst horrors that they will ever experience in the face of this earth. The day the Lord comes like a thief to them, in which the heavens will pass away. We just covered a whole span. We just covered seven years of tribulation, a thousand years of millennium, whatever amount of time it takes for those judgments, we just covered all of that. So at the very least, 1,007 years just got swallowed up in one phrase, okay? Heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with an intense heat. The earth and its works will be burned up. Earth as we know it, gone. Heavens as we know it, gone. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be? You ought to be in holy conduct and godliness. If you know that this one has that kind of power, you want to go against him? You want to stick your finger in his eye? No, you should be you should be holy and obedient and living into him to please him, acting the way he should be, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Okay, notice how it changes the day of God? When you're looking for the Lord to come back, you're not talking about the tribulation. For us as believers, we're talking about the rapture first, but for those living through the tribulation, they're going to be looking for the return of the Lord. And if you're looking for the Lord to come, how should you be acting? If we really believe in the imminent return of the Lord, and I do, and imminent means it can happen right now, this class could not end because we've gone home. We'll just keep it going up there. <laughs> if I really believe that, what do you think I'm going to do this morning? And what do you think I'm going to be doing tonight? Hmm, I don't care about the Lord. I don't care what he said. I just think I want to just sit here and just enjoy the let, let me go out and just sunbathe and let me you know sit my little drink and let the rest of the world worry about itself no no i want to tell everybody i care about do you know the lord are you secure that if you left this earth today you would be with him do you know where you're going do you know what's going to happen do you know what the future What's going to happen? When you hear that news tonight and it rocks your boat and it scares you because you think, what is coming to this world? And especially if you're in Israel, watching your enemies get stronger around you and knowing that, that you're in a bad neighborhood. I want to tell you how to get secure. I want to tell you, don't fear. And not because I'm telling you, what am I going to do for you? Absolutely nothing. But let me tell you about my God. Yeah. Let me tell you who gives me peace. Let me tell you who gives me answers. Let me tell you what helps me <coughs> in my battles. I want to be doing that. I want to get it out. I want to tell them. And if I'm not out there telling them, I want to drink it in. I want to be studying what he said so I can understand it better, teach it better, share it better, so that I can feel his joy. Because when I open up his word and I read his word, I'm reading my love letter. Remember, that's what this is. This Bible is a love letter. He wrote it to us in love. He signed it in blood. He gave his blood for me. Oh, I want to read it. Oh, I want to know him. If you are in love with somebody, you want to know everything about them. You study them. You watch them. And then you want to please them. That's what it should be doing for us. If you are complacent, 
I should be making you feel so uncomfortable right now that you want to get out of this class and get out of hearing my voice. Well, you know what? It's not my voice you're hearing. It's the voice of the Lord. It's the voice of your father saying, are you about my business? Are you doing what I've put you here to do? Do you want that neighbor, that coworker, that friend that you haven't shared it with stand before God at this day, <coughs> at Great White Throne, and turn around and see you standing there in, in your heavenly robe in the glories of the Lord while he's being condemned, and have him ask you, why didn't you tell me? Yes. Now, no one's going to go to hell because you didn't tell him. You just miss out on the blessing for doing it. God's not going to want to go to hell because you didn't use your voice. Right. He, he needs to use a donkey, and he used the donkey in Scripture. <laughs> he will use it. And oh, by the way, why are the heavens done away with? I believe because they've been our roadmap. Remember, the glory of God's in the heavens. The gospel message is in the heavens. It's done. It's all rolled up now, and he's going to lay out a new map for us. Hallelujah. Interesting. I wonder what it's going to look like. I have no idea. But this is what it should be doing. Not giving us room for complacence. Not giving us room to sit. We need to believe that today is the last day that I have on this earth. What am I doing with it? We all get the same amount of time, but what are we doing with it? And guess what? If it isn't even in his imminent return, it may be our last day because no one is guaranteed tomorrow. I don't care who you are and what walk of life. My dearly beloved pastor, co-pastor Frederick, was coming to this class. And he didn't make it here. That morning, I believe, because we don't know the exact time he lived alone. God said, come home. And he went home. He was a pastor. No guarantee, no matter what you walk, no matter what you're doing, that you'll be here tomorrow. And we live in this. Let's party hardy. No. Remember in Daniel's day, Belshazzar, eat, drink, be merry. He saw him and right on the wall. <laughs> the handwriting's on the wall. The handwriting is here. Whichever way it is, whether it's the end of our life or whether it's the return of our Lord for us who are believers, today could be it. Do what you can for the Lord now. Do it in love and by the power of the Spirit. Don't go out Try to choke it down somebody's throat. I'm not telling you to do that because that will just make them scatter. But do it in love. Love them enough to conquer your own. I can't do that. I can't talk. What if they ask a question I don't know? You know what you say? I don't know. <laughs> and you tell them, I'll go get the answer for you and I'll come back. We aren't know-it-alls, people. He is. And I guarantee you, whatever words you need to say, you will watch yourself saying, you ever had that experience? I know. I have literally stood outside, watched my mouth go, and thinking, go, God, go, God. Go. It's not me. It's the Holy Spirit within me. I had an opportunity in the middle of a bustling nurse's station in a rehabilitation as our dearly beloved was going home to heaven. And I was sent out because... God was working a mighty miracle, and suddenly they had me a phone, and I am standing there, literally, it is bustling, but all of a sudden, it gets all quiet, and what am I saying, the person on the end of the phone, unsafe Jewish woman, has just asked, I asked this church to pray for you guys, was that okay, because I don't know of church, <laughs> yeah, that's okay, because it's not a matter of church. Right. It's a matter of a relationship. And if they have a relationship with the Lord, yes, they can pray. Let me tell you how you get that relationship with the Lord. And I don't remember what all I said, but I remember I stood there and got to give out the entire gospel. Doctors, nurses, patients, friends, workers, all around. I have no idea. Mm. I stood there saying, Go, Lord, go, Lord, get him, Lord. I was so yes. excited for what the Lord was doing. And I hope someone walks up to me in heaven one day and says, You remember that incident? The Lord used those words to touch my heart. Notice he used me. He used those words. Will he do the same in you? Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't care how scared you are. Gideon, man of valor, was he acting like that? No. no. 
<laughs> somebody out there. <laughs> Let me, let me win out real quick before they come so maybe I can get my food and take it home to feed my family. He wasn't acting like a man. He wasn't a man's man. He wasn't a man of valor. But the angel comes to him and calls him that. And what do we see him become? In the power of God. Yes. We see God take his huge army and bring him down to 300 people against the greater army. Right. Do you feel outnumbered? Do you feel like you can't speak? Moshe said, I can't speak, God. You get a bad mouth. I... <laughs> All right. I'll send you Aaron to be your mouthpiece, but you can do it. You're still my leader. I'm going to work through you. And then the scripture tells us that there's a prophet coming like Moses. Hear ye him. Moses is held up as one of the greatest in Jewish belief. And it should be because he is such a picture for the coming of Messiah. When you see one like the prophet, like Moshe, listen to him. <coughs> wow. Hallelujah. I got my soapbox. Come back down. What's the motivation of all this? Okay. <laughs> I'm no one preaching to the choir. But for whatever reason, when I take off, again, it's not me. It's the Holy Spirit. So if he's tugging at your heart, if he's convicting you, if he's encouraging you, take it. Take it. Take it. And trust him. He does it all. I'm worthless. He does it all. I don't get up here and teach this class. He gets up here and teaches this class. I just get the privilege of being used. And it's <laughs> Zechariah. Zechariah. Go to Zechariah. Go to chapter 12. And we're going to read there. We're looking at what is the motivation for all of this. Why is this all happening? We're at the culmination. What are we going to read in Zechariah chapter 12, verses 1 through 3? The problem of Jerusalem is going to be settled. The burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Israel, this is a burden. This is a heaviness. There's a problem. This isn't the joy. No, Jerusalem's got a burden. Thus declares the Lord who stretches out the heavens and lays the foundations of the earth and forms the spirit of man within him. We just covered the whole gamut of creation. What's been left out? The God of creation. Look at this world. Do you know there were just new pictures sent back by Israel's spacecraft that's headed for the, the moon? Mm -hmm. And they took pictures of Earth and looked back at Earth. They're beautiful. Mm -hmm. We got a beautiful planet here just hanging in space. Mm -hmm. How'd it get there? Mm -hmm. Are you foolish enough, and I'll use the word, to believe that there was slime and a river bank? <laughs> bang? <laughs> well, Roger wears a shirt that tells you it was the big bang. God said it, and bang, it happened. <laughs> I like his shirt. <laughs> this God who stretched out the heavens. And by the way, in Jeremiah, it tells us when they can measure the heavens, then there can be an end of Israel. Do you know what keeps happening in science? Oh, we found another planet. Oh, we found another galaxy. Oh, we found another black hole. And we don't know how deep that black hole is. They can't measure the heavens. They think they're so smart. And they can't measure the heavens. God said it. This one, who did all creation and also... I see the magnanimous huge, and now it comes down to the small, and forms the spirit in man. God breathed into man, and he became a living soul. Till God breathed into him, he was just a bunch of elements, a bunch of chemicals. He was just dust. Till God breathed in. The one who did this, who forms that spirit of man within him, says, Behold! Oh, are you awake? Yeah. Are you paying attention? Remember, that's God's wake-up call. I am going to make Jerusalem a cup. But notice this cup. I'm going to make it a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around. Have you ever heard something so horrible happening, it just makes you reel? Well, that's what's going on in Jerusalem. Remember, the city is being ravished. The houses are being rifled. The women are being molested and worse. And they're going off into captivity also. All of this is happening. Yes, it's going to cause all peoples around to reel. And when that siege, and it is a siege, is against Jerusalem, a heavy stone, a weight for all peoples, because remember, the whole focus of the world is there. I see that all the time. 
that God always puts a focus in Israel. Do you know it's one of the tiniest places on the face of this earth? And look how much attention it gets in the media. Every time you turn around, God's drawing attention there. And when it is this bad, it's also against Judah. Remember, we had the, the house of Israel and the house of Judah when they were separated and they were civil war with each other. And he's saying that whole area, everything that makes up Israel, and they've never had their full territory, but it will come about in that day. I will make Jerusalem, I lost my place. <laughs> it will come about that day. I'll make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all peoples. All who lift it will be severely injured. Those who come against it, they're going to pay the price. They are going to hurt. All the nations of the earth are going to be gathered against it. Remember, the Antichrist headquarters is there now, and everybody's coming at them. Russia's coming down saying, uh-uh, I want my part. Egypt's coming up and saying, I'm not going to let you have it. We want it. Here comes the kings from the east who dried up the Euphrates. who are coming across 200,000, 000, and guess what? China has an army, that number today. And then the Western Bloc coming across too because they're going to say, hey, We've got a stake in this too. So when all that happens in that day, when all the nations are, are gathered against it, in that day declares the Lord, verse 4, I will strike every horse with the bewilderment and his rider with madness. Those that are warring, and there apparently is, literally, I think, because of the description in so many places and so many times, that there is going to be warfare as it was before. I think there's going to be warfare on all kinds of levels, from nuclear to horses. When all that's going, he's going to make them all go crazy with madness. What's going on? We can't comprehend this. But I, God speaking, I will watch over the house of Judah while I strike every horse of the peoples with blindness and the, the clans, the, the tribes of Judah will say in their hearts, a strong support for us are the inhabitants of Jerusalem. How? Through the Lord of hosts, their God. Jerusalem's finally going to start waking up and realizing when she is being torn to shreds at this time that here comes her salvation. Here comes her Messiah. That's what she's going to see. When he comes back in his glory, we're going to hit it. In fact, I'm going to take you there right now, even though it's out of order on your pages. Still, you're going to come to it so soon. The people of Israel are going to be delivered. Because we're right here, look at verse 10. This is huge because at this time, when all of this has come up, Jerusalem is under that dread. The worst of the worst that has ever been at that time. God still speaking says, I will pour out on the house of David. You don't get more Jewish than the house of David, people. I will pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Where is this happening? This is happening in Israel. This is happening to the Jewish people. Where it is, what is happening? The spirit of grace. Wow, what do they need? They need grace. They need not what they deserve. They need to get what they don't deserve. That's what grace is. God's saying, I'm going to pour out my spirit of grace. Do you see God the Father speaking? Do you see God the Holy Spirit acting? We've got two parts. But guess what? We've got a triunity. Three and one. Keep reading. So they will look on me. God's still speaking. They will look on me, whom they have pierced. When was God pierced? Jesus. The, cross. the cross in Yeshua Jesus, in the Son of God. In the third part of our triunity, we see the whole triunity, the whole trinity involved in this act. The Spirit coming forth to bring the grace, God the Father declaring it, the Son had lifted out. He was pierced literally pierced nail prints in the hands in the feet the sword in the side he was pierced and they're going to see me they're going to see me are you catching this this is the lord's return they're going to see him and when they see him they're going to mourn for him oh whoa <clears throat> as if he were their only son and they had lost their son through death they're finally getting the veil of blindness removed, and they're seeing him, and they're going to weep bitterly over him, like weeping over the firstborn. In that day, there'll be a great mourning, M-O-U-R-N, mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning, and it gives an example here in the plain of Megiddo. Megiddo's going to be filling it also. It goes on that how much mourning is going on. What is happening is at this moment, when he is returning, 
to Jerusalem, coming through Bozrah, as we're going to read. And remember, this is coming to culminate to do his purpose, to settle the problem of Jerusalem, <coughs> to show the power of God, to deliver the people of Israel because he promised them deliverance, to be the promised Messiah, to set up his kingdom. This is all was going to be done to declare him, and we're going to get there. <coughs> Before we end today, we're going to get there to be declared King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That means there's other kings. That means there's other lords. There are on the earthly nation, the earthly world, whatever I should say. But he is ultimate, and that's what we're seeing. That's what's happening here. This is when Israel will look up and see her redemption. And when God said in another place, when Israel says, Baruch haba Hashem Adonai, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Then I will return. That's what they're saying. They're going to look up and they're going to say, Oh my God, you are Messiah. And those who are realizing that at that moment, it is their moment of salvation. It's not going to be that they all are seeing it, but those who are that saving remnant in Israel, literally seeing it, are going to realize and declare it. And the Lord is going to fulfill it. Look with me, it's off your things, but look with me at the very next chapter, 13 at verse 1. Just, and that's how far we're going to go. We'll stop it there because I could go here the rest of the day and I won't. But in that day, when the Lord returns in that day, a fountain will be opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Why? For sin and impurity. What's the fountain? It's the flow of blood. The blood of Messiah is going to be open for them to come in and have their sins forgiven and come into a right relationship with the Lord. Finally, Jerusalem representing Israel is finally going to be in a right relationship with her King, her Lord, her Messiah, her Savior. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 Finally, finally, it'll be cut, come out in that day, declares Lord. I told you it wouldn't go on. But in that name, he says he's going to cut off all the evil. He's going to cut off the, the idols. He's going to cut off the faults. And it's only going to be the true. The people of Israel will be delivered. Because I want to get to the other points. Let me give you other scriptures to look at. Ezekiel, Ezekiel 37, 25 to 28. That's where he's being asked, will these dry bones live again? And he's being told, yes, they will. Um, also, and where I want to take you, because this is so misunderstood too, Romans 11, 25 to 27. While you're getting to the book of Romans, know that chapters 9, 10, and 11 deal heavily with Israel. Israel past, chapter 9. Israel present, chapter 10. Israel future, chapter 11. So we're going to chapter 11. We're going to the future. When you read in chapter 10, you will have Paul saying, Oh, brother, my heart's desire is that all of Israel be saved. That's where we're at when we're crying for the salvation of the Jewish people. Remember the gospel that, that Shaul Paul is preaching and teaching from chapter 1 of Romans, verse 16. I am not ashamed, Paul is saying, of the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Messiah is what he's saying. For it is the power of God and the salvation to all who will believe, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Remember God's order. God never had an oops Never had a, I forgot the Gentiles. Never had a, oh, well, I, I'll, I'll come up with plan B, and in plan B, I'll bring you Gentiles in. Never, 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 never. God has never failed in his perfect plan, and he never replaces. When he says it will be, it will be. So his plan from the beginning was to use Israel as the nation to be the mouthpiece to the world, and that's what Paul's declaring. We've got to get the Jews saved to take the gospel to the Gentiles also. In our ministry that is aimed at Jewish people, I am thankful to the Lord to say we've had a number of Gentiles saved along the way. They are just as dear, just as precious. In this, now, that I've sidetracked you with, with uh, the Gentiles being grafted in and God coming back to his plan with Israel that was never sideswiped, never, uh-oh, I've got a problem. No, in his perfect plan, he intended to open up this door for the Gentiles to come in in the way that they did to provoke jealousy to the Jewish people. Now they've come back, he's bringing them back into focus and into the position they're going to be in because in the millennium, it will be the time of the Jews. 
Right now it is the time of the Gentiles. Israel's not head nation. It is not controlled by the Jews. I don't care what people say this world is not controlled by the Jews. In the millennial, it will be head nation. It will get the fulfillment of all those promises. And that's what we're coming down to in chapter 11, looking at Israel's future. Verse 25 Shaol Paul says, I don't want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery. This mystery. This mystery. Mystery in Scripture, especially with Paul, is something that was not known before that's being revealed now. That's why it was a mystery. We didn't know. If Israel understood that she was going to be set aside and the Gentiles come in because she was going to reject her Messiah at that time, then when Messiah was offering Israel the kingdom, they would have said, uh-uh, excuse me, no, we know you're not doing that. We know you're going to do this other plan. God hid it from them. He didn't tell us in the original covenant about the age of Christ. He hid that from Israel so that it was a genuine offer of Israel, of their Messiah. He knew what they were going to do. So he had the whole plan made. But he didn't reveal it until it's transpired to that point. He, the kingdom is still being offered to Israel in Acts at first. When they first, the, the, there's times of denial. First they tell the people, they tell Paul and, and Peter and others, don't talk. Then they, um, what's the second step? Is the second step when they beat them? I think the second step is when they beat them. It is, okay? First, you can't talk in that name. Don't talk to us about Jesus. Shut your mouths. Of course they don't. So, okay, we'll beat you. We'll beat you into compliance. They beat them. What do we have happening when they've been beaten and then they're in the prison? They're praising God. They're preaching the gospel. And the whole jail gets saved. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> they're still being offered the kingdom. It comes finally to the point four times in the beginning between, I think it's chapter 2 and 7 in uh, Acts. Finally, at the, the fourth time, when they've been offered this kingdom, they are so convicted by the words of Stephen, the first martyr, that instead of turning that conviction, they turn against him, and they martyr him. They stone him to death. Who's holding the, the cloaks of the ones doing it? Paul. Shaol, Paul, before he's Paul. Holding those cloaks, man, he's probably the one that brought the charges against Stephen. Remember, he was so zealous for God. I'm killing as many as I can, God. I'm taking them out right and left. I don't care if they're male or female. If I can't kill them, I'm getting them put in jail. I'm doing you such a favor. And he's riding his horse in, and God knocks him off his high horse and says, how long will you come against me? Who are you, Lord? Well, let me tell you who I am. And look at the change that comes. Hallelujah. When Israel finally martyrs the ones that are speaking, that's when God says, okay, Israel, I've given you these chances. The same way a parent says to a child, if you don't get in line, you're going to suffer the consequences. You're still my child, but you're going to suffer the consequences of your action. So finally, okay, Israel, you don't want me that badly. I'll let you go your way. I'll let you be the prodigal son. You're going to go out, and you're going to think it's great, and you're going to end up eating from the hogs, which, by the way, are non-kosher, so you know how far a Jewish kid fell to be working with a non-kosher animal and, and wanting to eat their food. That, but what does he realize? Oh, hey, it was far better in my father's house. Even if I'm a servant there, I'll eat better than this slop, and it won't be non-kosher. Let me go back home. And what does he find when he's coming toward home? He finds the father's been looking for him. Arms wide open and brings him in. Israel, God's arms are wide open, ready to bring them in. And there will be the day Israel comes back like that prodigal. There will be that day when they will see him and say, wow, yeah, we blew it. And they will be right with him. That's what we're reading here. In that day. This is what's going to happen. I don't want you ignorant of this, this mystery so you won't, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening. Partial doesn't mean whole, does it? If you go get a partial in your mouth from the dentist, they don't take out the whole tooth and give you a whole new, do they? They don't replace, do they? It's a partial, okay? There's a partial 
hardening. Why is that important? Because then part of the non-partial part. I'm the part that, thank God, my eyes were opened by the Spirit so that I did receive. He never cuts off all the Jews. Any who will come to him, the same way any Gentile who will come to him are still brought in. But there's this partial happening for a time. They are going to, as a whole, as a nation of Israel, they're going to have their hearts hardened. They're going to be against me. They're going to be outside of my will. They're going to even be scattered. And we know they were scattered. 70 AD, the only Jew found in Jerusalem was a dead Jew. And I don't mean that sarcastically. I mean that horrendously. They were being slaughtered. They ran for their lives. They've been scattered ever since. They're still scattered. They're in the dispersion. I'm a Jew in dispersion because my home is not in Israel. Okay? We are scattered. There's a partial hardening that has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Remember, that's what's going on right now. It's the time of the Gentiles. That's why you have Gentile kings, Gentile rulership. That's why you don't have Messiah sitting on the throne on earth. But it's for a time. There's going to be a time when God's going to say, okay, I have brought in how many were intended during this time. What are we waiting for for the Lord's return? We're waiting for that last one to get saved that's supposed to get saved on that side of it. And when that last one saves, so by the way, get out there and let's get everybody, let's, let's witness, let's tell people so we can get that last one saved and go home. When it's done, the fullness of Gentiles has been completed. God's going to raise up his, what we call church, take them home to heaven to be with him, and it go right on with his plan for Israel. That's what's being said, said here. The fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and now, through the tribulation, through the consequences of their actions, they'll come to that final day where they finally will see me and realize who I am and turn to me, and it's then that all Israel, verse 26, will be saved. Okay, it doesn't mean every individual, but it is telling us that the nation of Israel is going to be delivered. The nation of Israel is going to survive the tribulation. Other nations are going to end. They will not go on. They will not be found in the millennium. You'll be surprised at the ones that are, though. The ones you think won't are going to be there. They're suffering consequences, but they'll be there. We'll touch that when we get to Revelation 20. But he says, at this time, Israel will be saved. The deliverer. Who is the deliverer? Messiah, Jesus, will come from Zion. He's going to come from the earthly, from the heavenly Jerusalem to the earthly Jerusalem. He's going to remove ungodliness from Jacob. Jacob is a synonymous name for Israel. He's going to take that ungodliness out. Why? Because when he starts with the millennium, he's starting with those saved. He's starting with the believing remnant. Okay, we'll get into that too because we'll hit Matthew 25, the sheep and goats judgment, and see who goes into the millennium. This is my covenant with them. What's a covenant? A covenant is a promise. Does God keep his promises? Yes. yes. So when he says, this is my covenant with Israel, what covenant did he make with Israel? He made an Abrahamic covenant. He made the... the, um, uh, the, the well, let me just take you all the way because I'm trying to hurry. To the new covenant. Promise... In Jeremiah, in Jeremiah, he promised, I will put a heart, I'll take out the, the stony heart, the heart that was law and blew it and broke it, the heart of flesh, and I'm going to put in a heart of, of, when it calls it flesh, it's his flesh, it's circumcised, okay? I'm going to circumcise their hearts, not outwardly, I'm going to do it on the inside. I'm going to be in them, I'm going to be their God, and they're going to be my people. It's called the new covenant in, in Jeremiah 31. 31, he says, Behold the new covenant. Yeah. And he's talking to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, and his people. That's Israel. He's not talking to the church. The church isn't there. Okay, he's talking to his people. When he tells his Talmudim, and this is a Passover, when he's giving them the third cup of redemption, which comes out of Exodus 6, which is the time when they're being told that he's going to give his life for them. And they're not understanding it yet, but we see it foreshadowed. And if you don't understand, come to Passover. My favorite part of Passover. I'm hitting on it right now. He takes that cup and he says to his Talmudim, this is my blood. This is the new covenant given to you. This is my blood which is shed for you for the remission of sins. 
he's telling how this is foreshadowing. He's showing that cup of redemption was his blood that would be shed. He is promising Israel the new covenant. Is he saying Gentiles don't get it? No. Gentiles all along could come in. They just had to come in in a certain way. But he's saying it does go to Israel, to the believers, to the remnant who will believe. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. When he is done away with their sins, he is their God. He is their Messiah, and they are his people. And hallelujah, we see it in all his glory. That's what's being said here in Romans 11, 25 through 27. Now let's get back to what's going to bring us back into Revelation. I didn't know we'd sit here this long, but this is critical. We're going to see the person of the Messiah is declared. This is where he is going to be declared. We'll see it in verse 16, King of kings and Lord of lords. But let's look first at Isaiah 45. Okay? Because we're keeping it in its context. We're keeping it where it belongs. We love the church because we're part of the church, but hallelujah, <laughs> we're out of here. Our rewards are heavenly. We're citizens of heaven, and we're rejoicing in the glories that are ours forevermore. We've got, I think, the supreme promises to what Israel gets. Now, I love what Israel gets. I love Israel. <laughs> but I'm thrilled my home is heavenly, and my glories are heavenly forever. Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45 and verse 22 is where we will start and we read there. Turn to me. Turn to God. Turn to Elohim. Turn to Adonai. Turn to the Lord. Turn to me and be saved. All the ends of the earth. See? He didn't say just Israel. All the earth. Turn to me and, and, and you'll be saved. For I am God and there is no other. I've sworn by myself. Because there was no one greater he could swear by. There was no one else. So I swear by me. That's like, like a double promise to us, okay? I swore by myself, the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness, and it will not turn back. The word of the Lord is not void. It goes and it does what it says, and I love this. That to me, to God, every knee will bow. Every tongue will swear allegiance. Okay, not just Israel, every knee, every tongue, every nation, everywhere. Everyone will bow. They will save me only in the Lord, our righteousness and strength. Men will come to him. All who are angry at him will be put to shame. In the Lord, all the offspring of Israel will be justified and will glory. They don't glory in themselves. They glory in the Lord. They glory in him. He is being declared. And the whole world will reap in that. The whole world will see him finally as who he is. I think we've read it enough in, in Zechariah 14.9. I'm skipping a lot of references that are on your, your um, sheets. I need to say them. I'll say them too fast for you to write. But the video audience can stop the, the tape. Zechariah 14.9. Revelation 11, 15 to 17, and then back in 1916. It's the promise of Messiah being declared. The promises of God will be done. I kept you in Isaiah on purpose. Go to chapter 46, the very next chapter, and you'll get there faster than I am because I stopped it electronically. We're going to look at verse 9. Isaiah 46, 9. Remember the former things long past, for I am God. And there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me, declaring from the, declaring the end from the beginning. From ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, My purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Okay, it's all going to be accomplished. He promised it in the past. It hasn't been seen, but he's saying it's going to be fulfilled in the future. It will be done. Go to chapter 55. 11 and 12. Chapter 55, Isaiah 55, 11 and 12. And I think it sounds like Eric's there ahead of us, yes. So will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty. I forgot I was going to read it. I just said it a minute ago. Without <laughs> accomplishing what I desire. Without succeeding in the matter for which I sent. What I said, what I intended, what my word went out to do, it will be done. Remember, I tell you all the time, take it to the bank. Cash it in. It will be done. 
I love 12. Let's read it fast. You will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Do you know all of creation is going to rejoice with us? We're told creation is mourning, is groaning, it's waiting to be released. Also, remember, it has the sin taint on it, too. All of God's creation is going to sing His glory. That's why when it says the stars are going to sing, I think they're going to sing. <laughs> this is glorious. Yes. Okay, and Matthew, to bring it into the new uh, covenant, or the, the new, um, yeah, we call it the new covenant. I want you to see it there. Also, Matthew 24, just verse 35. We've been through 24 time and time and time again. But I want you to see that it says heaven and earth will pass away. Remember when I hit on 2 Peter, 2 Kepha, and it talked about the elements burning up and heaven was going to, to fall apart and earth's going to burn up. And we'll talk about that more because we're going to get into that time before we get to the very end of Revelation. That will pass away. What won't pass away? My words. And there's another place in Matthew, I think it's a little earlier in the chapter, I don't have the reference, but we'll find it for next week, where it says not one jot or one tittle will pass away until my word has been accomplished. That's the little, that's like Dot and I are crossing a T. It's little marks that maybe aren't that necessarily important. If you don't dot your I, we still know it's an I, that God's saying not even that much will fail. My word will be completely fulfilled, and then we will see heaven and earth can even pass away and will. So let's hit that victory. Let's get into Revelation. Go back to chapter 19, and we are actually ready for verse um, 15. Revelation, I mean 16, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to look at 15, make sure I did it, but I think I did. Um, I got chapter 16. How did I do that? Chapter, I got the right book, give me the right chapter. Chapter 19, verse 15. Yeah, we, did it. We, did. We, we talked about God the Almighty, so 16, and here we go. Ready for some fun? Yes. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name Fable written. King, King of kings, kings and Lord of lords. lords. This Hallelujah. is glorious. On his vesture, on his garment, on his robe, we see his name. You ever seen boxers that put his name up here? Well, it's on his thigh, I think, because even though he comes with the sword out of his mouth, he's not fighting militarily. It's not a sword at his side. So where the sword would be, the weapon of war that earth would use, it's his name. What slays them? His name. Remember in the garden when Yeshua was being captured? Wrong word, but being taken. Okay, by all the soldiers, and yes, if you got it, she remembers. They ask, "Are you Messiah? You know, are you this one?" And he says, "I am." That's that great statement. What happened to them? <laughs> Power of his words knocked them on their keisters. On their tukas. That should have told them. Those soldiers. To be knocked off their feet just by the power of his name. To see keep it cut off an ear and see the Lord pick it up and put it back on. That should have told them. They should have, they, in my opinion, they should start running in fear. Whoa, I'm not touching this one. <laughs> amazing, amazing. But where you would expect it to show military might, he's showing his name is the might. We've talked about his names, but we're going to hit it again just a little bit. King of Kings is an earthly title. It is saying he's king over the whole world, where Lord of Lords is a heavenly title, saying he is master of all. It is royal sovereignty. One of my sources says king par excellence and lord par excellence, and I love that, but let me give you a little bit more, and I'm going to be tripping on top of myself with these two words, but it's talking about absolute dominion over all of creation, over the whole realm. Remember all, heaven, earth, under the earth, the whole realm. He is supreme. He will establish his kingdom as head. He will not have any who come up against him. He is head. At the end, when Satan is loosed, that's a different time, but he is going to reign supreme over all. Remember the first coming, he said, God made him a little lower than the angels. Now he's lifted up where he belongs in all his majesty. 
He will conquer because he is King of kings and Lord of lords. Look with me at Ephesians 1, 21. Ephesians 1, come on. Ephesians 1, 21. We're going to actually read 121 through 23. I don't believe it is on your cross-reference sheet, so you may want to put it down, because every time I say the names of God, I get more. It is inexhaustible. I love it. Ephesians 1, 21. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, not only at this time, but in the time to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet. You know, that's the victory. When you see the old pictures of victory, they've got their foot on the enemy, under their foot, and they raise their army in victory. Picture him that way. Under his feet, all enemies. Where, that, where was I? I'm in 21 still. Yes. Name, okay. They should come. He put all things in subjection under his feet. And he gave him as head over all things to the church. Okay? To the body of Christ, he is the head. But this body, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. He's the head of the church. He's the head of the world. He is the head of his creation. And he is that of supreme. King of kings and Lord of lords. It's at that name, that name we've already just read, every knee will bow. That is humbleness. That is not them declaring, oh, I love you and I'll worship you. We bow in that kind of reference. But they're going to have to admit it. They have to eat crow. And that's a foul thing to do. <laughs> Lord of Lord emphasizes power, emphasizes authority. Go with me, because I love this too. Go with me to Deuteronomy real quick. Deuteronomy 10. Deuteronomy, Devarim, chapter 10. Come on, give me my books. I'm trying to hurry because I'm fighting that clock. Remember, I know I'm not in heaven because I've got to deal with clocks. 17. Deuteronomy, Devarim, chapter 10, verse 17. Sounds very similar. It says, For the Lord your God is a God of gods, and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, awesome God, who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. Okay, here we're seeing those names given to God. But where have we been seeing those names given? To whom? Jesus. Messiah. Yeshua. Well, wait a minute. God's got those names. But wait a minute. Yeshua's got those names. This one's right, and this one's right, and you know what? They're both right. <laughs> God and Yeshua, once again, Revelation 1. Remember how the names were so intertwined that about the time we decided we're talking and looking at the description of God the Father, all of a sudden we're looking at the description of God the Son. When we're looking at God the Son, all of a sudden we're seeing God the Father. That's what's happening here. God the Father and God the Son are both being spoken of as King of Kings, Lord of Lords, God of all. We are seeing his supremacy. We're seeing his authority. We're seeing his sovereignty. We're seeing his victorious title. We're seeing his deity. We're seeing his supreme power. We are seeing it all. Hallelujah. Praise to God. Final note, go to 1 Timothy 1.17. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 17. And we read in 1 Timothy 1.17, Now to the king, eternal. Now to the king, immortal. Now to the king, invisible. Now to the king, the only God, the honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Yeah. Have you ever heard a good cheer of the game? <laughs> Let's cheer him on. Who is he? King of kings, Lord of lords, king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God. Be all honor and glory forever and ever. Don't even miss that. This isn't for a day. This isn't for a time. This isn't going to change. This is forever. So be it. That's what amen means. How do I get on a higher crescendo than this? Hallelujah, God. Through all time, through all glory, through all the horror that we had to go through in this tribulation, we come to this point in time. Hallelujah. What is that scripture? I just read to you 1 Timothy 1.17. I also have a note down to look at 6. Let's see if we can do 6 real fast. If not, I'll give you the reference. Come on. Chapter 6, and I have down 13 to 16. I honestly don't remember what they said right now. 1 Timothy 6, verse 13. 
Let's go ahead and just read it through because I like what I'm seeing. I charge you in the presence of God. Okay? The author is writing. It's Shaul Paul. Who is he writing to? His adopted son that he loves. Timothy, who he's passing the baton to. He's been pouring everything into Timothy and telling Timothy, find faithful ones, pour it into them. It's going to go on. Thank God for bringing Paul to Timothy because we get the results today. And he says, I charge you in the presence of God. Remember, we're in his presence. Do you feel him in this room today? Yes. Oh, do I. <laughs> in his presence. In the presence of God. Who is God? The one who gives life to all things. And of Messiah Yeshua, who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate. He declared who he was. He was. He is king of kings. Remember, they put that on the cross to mock him. The Jews caught it. Had a fit. Take that down. He's not our king. Lead it up. He is your king. And here he is in his glory. And here it is, it is saying, um, the confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Keep in obedience to him. Obey him. He is the one that, that is had the only true God, which verse 15 says, which he will bring about at the proper time. Okay, remember when he was born the first time? It said he came in the fullness of time. He didn't come a day early. He didn't come a month late. He came at the right time, in the fullness of time. When will he come in his second coming in all this glory? In the proper time, at the right moment. Not a day later, there'd be no flesh left alive. Not a day early, or they would not be to the point that Israel's going to look up and see who their Messiah is and declare it for all the world to see. At that proper time, here he comes. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, which no man has seen or can see to him the honor and eternal dominion forever. And remember when Moshe wanted to see his glory? Moshe saw that which remains behind, and that was enough for him to shine the glory light that will fill the earth. This is our King of Kings. This is our Lord of Lords. This is the one who is returning. This is the one who is receiving finally his just rewards. This is what we're seeing. And even though we didn't get far, we will travel better next week. We will start in verse 17 next week. Let me set you up for it. Let me whet your appetite. i got to get back to myself. Revelation 19 and we'll start looking at verse 17 because our scene's going to change. Here he's coming back. We see him in all that glory. We see him stop the battle of Armageddon. We see that he's been covering 200 miles of bloodshed. We see a, a horrendous picture of carnage. We're going to read about what happens to that carnage. There's a, a, a meal coming. But I'm going to tell you, we're going to compare that meal to another meal. And I'll ask you, which meal do you want to eat at? <laughs> okay? There's two different meals that we see, okay? But we're going to see that, the, that there's an angel that's going to come crying through the heavens to invite certain ones to this first meal. No, I'm sorry, this is the second one. But anyway, we'll get into that. You know what I'm talking about. I'm just trying to entice you. We're going to see that. We're going to see um, what happens to all that carnage, why it has to happen. We're going to see, finally, we've got the victory of the Lord. Second to that, we're going to see what happens to the beast and to the false prophet. And they get what they deserve. So we're going to see that happen next week. Come back. It will be an exciting chapter. I believe we'll probably even move from that into the description of the millennial kingdom. Do you know who goes into that kingdom? How does it start? Who goes into the kingdom? Who lives on earth in the royal kingdom? All this and more next week. Right. <laughs> any questions? Yes, ma'am. We don't have any references on verse 17. On verse 17. I have no references? Okay, probably because as we're reading it, yeah, it's just, it's giving us just a fact. There is nowhere to cross-reference it that will tie it in and give you cross-references in the other verses. So we don't see it referred to at another point in time, but we know what's happening. It's, it's just the history being given. 
So sometimes we just skip a verse or two from cross-references. Uh, it'll make sense when we're there. And if it raises any question, we'll find a, a reference that will fit. Okay, any other questions, comments? Yeah, I do. You said there were four times Jesus was rejected. I know, but the kingdom. They oh, the three of the kingdom to Israel, and they reject. Okay, so you're saying four. Stephen preached the Holy Spirit. That was Spirit. the fourth. The, the fourth, fourth was when they martyred him. First, they tell him they tell him to stop. Second, they um, second. I'm missing one because they beat them. Third is jailed him. Okay, in in chapters two to seven, the first time when they're they're. Again, rejecting the Lord's coming into heaven and the, the king is still being offered. Oh, and I should give you the point of why the Lord is standing. So let me give you that real fast. So they, the first time when the, the king is still being offered, if they would have accepted him as Messiah, he would turn around and come right back to heaven and set up his kingdom. He knew that wasn't going to happen. But that's what they're telling him when they're preaching. When they're first preaching, they're preaching the kingdom and it's still off in the kingdom. And the people tell him, stop. Don't talk it. The second time when they're being offered, because you didn't stop and you're not listening, we're going to beat you for it, and they beat them for it. The third time, they put them in jail. They jail them for it. The fourth time when it's being offered, they stone Stephen. And that's when God says, okay, now I'm going to bring in the Gentiles, wrap him in, and see if I can provoke you to jealousy. People say, how beautiful that the Lord stood up to receive Stephen. That's sweet, that's nice, that's lovely, but that's wrong. Oh. <laughs> the Lord had not yet sat down because that offer was being given, and he would have come back had they accepted. He knew. It wasn't that he didn't know, but he lets it play out. The same way you do as a parent to a child. I know you're going to do this, but I'm still going to do this. Okay, so he was still standing waiting for that and when that final rejection came where he says okay i'm going to work in another way i'm going to bring in the gentiles i'm going to give them that i don't want to call it a ball but you know that that that's so precious that when you see it in the hands of another you're going to say wait a minute i do want that yeah that was mine and i do want it and and thankfully it's not a give it back and you can have it is let me have it too with you but when, when he finally does that, when they finally come to that point, that's when he sits down. And God says, sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So then he sits waiting at the right hand of the Father. So he's standing until that final rejection as a whole, as a nation. Because what do we find happened? The one who brought that on, the one who we think brought Stephen up on the charges, is the one who God works it all through. Knocks him off his high horse, gives him the gospel. And hey, by the way, he was Jewish. So God's done with the Jews. What's he doing saving the Jewish soul? <laughs> we got a problem there. If God's rejected the Jew and he's done with the Jew, then why did he say Saul? <laughs> he should have found Saul a Gentile. But he did. Yes, he did take it to the Gentiles, but notice where he always went first, because he followed his mantra to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Every city he went into, every time he wanted to start a nucleus that we call church today, he looked for the believing Jews. He looked for the Jewish people where they meet to bring them the gospel, and any who believe that's who he formed the church around. The first churches were filled with Hebrew Christians. Yeah. Then the Gentiles came in. Yes, he went to the Gentile areas, but he looked for the Jews in the Gentile areas. And it goes on, and unfortunately it turns on his head, and now we've got the church filled with more Gentiles. And that's not bad. I don't mean that unfortunate that way, but I mean that the Jews aren't there too. Mm -hmm. But thankfully they're still coming in. I'm one. There are others also. And it will come back to that time where we will see it through the Jewish hands again, through the Jewish mouth being the spokes. And they have been fulfilling what God intended them to do, to be the people to bring God to the nation. Yes. 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 So the first members of the church were Messianic. Yes. The first, the first generation of the church was Messianic. Very much so. Hebrews is written to them. Who are the Hebrews? 
Are they Gentiles? Then why are they called Hebrews? Hebrews are those who have crossed over from idolatry to the one true living God. They were the Jewish people who crossed over. And he starts with them and he works through them and he tells them, yes, it's right, because the Hebrews is because they were being, uh oh, wait a minute, we're not doing everything that is required in the temple and the temple isn't letting us in anymore. I guess I'm not supposed to teach this, but I'm going to finish it. I think my battery went dead. Um, it, uh, I lost my train of thought now. Oh, to the Hebrews. They, at first, they were looked at as just another sect of Judaism. Pharisees, Sadducees, Gnostics, others. Here's the Hebrew Christians. But as time's moving on, and we're talking just, what, maybe 30 years at the most, in that time, we have it get to the point that because they're not doing the sacrifices and they're saying, you don't have to, we've got our permanent Lamb of God who was slain, so we don't have to do the blood of bulls and goats. The temple's going, then get out of here. If you're going to talk against us, get out of here. You're no longer wanted. And they were being pushed out. Well, now they don't have the benefit of all the scripture. They don't have the benefit of all of Paul's teachings. They don't have the benefit of, of sitting down, opening up, and reading, getting their answers. They've had ingrained in them since birth. You have to be in Israel, in the commonwealth of Israel, to receive the blessings of God that are coming, those millennial blessings. So all of a sudden they're saying, wait a minute, if we're pushed out here and God comes back to Israel, comes back to his temple, we're going to miss out. Maybe maybe we got something wrong. And so God raises up, I believe, Shaul Paul, who is the one who would have the authority to speak it and teach it and tell it, who I also believe is finishing his trilogy of the just shall live by faith, not by law, but by faith. And he answers those Hebrew Christians, and he says, don't worry. Don't let it rock your boat. You have not missed the safe harbor of salvation. And don't say, I'll pass it, go away. If you reject Yeshua, you miss out. If you're in Yeshua, whether you're in the temple, whether you're in the land of Israel, you are in Yeshua. In Him are all the promises. You're not missing out. You've got the better. You don't just have the house now. You have the one who made the house in you now. You don't have the blood of bulls and goats now. You have the blood of Messiah now. You don't have the high priest who might be ornery, sinful. He might be good. There were good ones, but there were also ornery ones, so they're not good. You don't have them now interceding in the middle for you. You get to, through that blood, come in yourself, and the one interceding is the one in heaven. His name is Yeshua. He's the one interceding for you now. And guess what? He never dies. He died in his human form once for all, and he resurrected, so he is your permanent high priest, your better high priest. And again, the whole book of Hebrews points those Hebrew people from the, the beginning that was a shadow of the heavenly, perfect, fulfilled, greater, and best. The blood is not put on the mercy seat in Jerusalem. It's put on the mercy seat in heaven. Why can we go into heaven now, literally, when we die? Why could Paul say to be absent from the body is present with the Lord? Remember, they used to go into the heart of the earth. They used to go into the paradise side of Sheol. When Yeshua died on the cross, he went into the paradise, into Sheol, into the heart of the earth. Not in the hell. If they didn't go suffer, he said on the cross, it is finished. But why did he go into the heart of the earth? Why do we go into heaven? Because he had to take his blood. He had to put it on the mercy seat in heaven to cleanse there so that when we go through heaven's gate, we're going through his shed blood. Is that the sheet wavering? That, I'm sorry? Is that the sheet wavering of Jesus into the Holy of Holies? I wouldn't say because I think you're mis mixing up Shavuot. Um, okay. Talk to me 101 and, and I'll okay. see if, if I'm misunderstanding you. But this is the one where Hebrews says he's gone through the veil. Right. 
Okay, if you talk about that, yes. Yeah. This okay. is the, the veil that separated the holy place and mm -hmm. the holy of holies where the mercy seat was, mm -hmm. where the propitiation is made, where atonement is made, where the blood was put once a year on day of atonement, forgiveness of sin for all the people, where when they see the high priest come out, they realize they've been accepted again, and, and the hurrah, where when we see our Messiah in all his glory, we know we've been accepted. If his blood was just put in earthly Jerusalem, mm -hmm. it would not have cleansed heaven we would still not be able to go into heaven, but because we're changed on the way up from, from moral into immorality. Immortality. <laughs> immortality. <laughs> Sorry, Lord. Into immortality, because we come through that shed blood that's been put on the mercy seat in heaven. Now the heaven was open. Now we can go right into the presence of the Lord in heaven. We don't have to go wait in the heart of the earth as they did before. Now we get to go right into his presence. So Paul does say to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When you're present with the Lord, you're not in the heart of the earth. We know he's sitting at the right hand of God the Father. We saw him in Revelation 5. We saw the Lamb take from the hand of God. We see him sitting on the throne. We see him return in 19. He is coming from heaven. He's not coming out of the heart of the earth. He's coming from heaven. He is the Lord of Lords. King of Kings, and he procured it all for us for all time. I think I got off my track, but the point being, that is the battle. That is the picture. That's what was completed, and that is what we are seeing. So that Hebrews is addressing them and telling them, go on, go on. Don't go back to the shadows. Go on. you got the real. When you've got the real, you don't want the shadow. You've got the real. If When my little niece was, was young, Shadows used to scare her. She'd see that shadow and she'd try to run away from her own shadow. <laughs> but if you saw someone embrace a shadow and hug a shadow and say, I love a shadow, you'd say, I'm not much sugar enough. <laughs> but they hug the real. We get to hug the real. We get to be in the presence of the real. We go right in the presence, and that is where we will be forever with the Lord. So we come back and we will reign with Him, but we are with Him. So I hope that answers whatever question was, because I am off. I have now gone way past. Okay. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. If there are any other questions, we'll talk, because people need to talk. So, dear Lord God, thank you. King of kings, Lord of lords, hallelujah. Glory and honor the immortal, invisible, eternal God. Thank you, you will be visible even to this earth one day. Thank you, your promises are sure and true. Thank you that you are in each one of us. Thank you that you tabernacle in us, that we don't have to go into a tabernacle or a temple. We don't have to wait outside the veil. You opened the way, and we are one with you in you. It is you who is in us. Lord God, light us on fire this week. Use us to your glory. Enable us to do what is beyond us, and may it all be to bring glory, honor, everything to your holy name. And Lord God, we adore you forever and ever and ever in your precious name. Your ineffable name, your holy name, you are indescribable. But we say, Hallelujah! Thank you, Amen. Amen.